was important to have a few words on choice of OVD uh, in, in, in phago surgery. So I'm also going to talk about some other choices and, and OVD. Okay. Thanks. Because of time constraint, I'm not going to talk about the material. I'm not going to talk about the optic edge. And I'm not going to talk about color of the IR. I'm just going to focus purely on optics because optics is uh, there's so many different IR, there's so many things to talk about. Okay, so the IR today, you can have two major types. We're not going to talk about some of the rare ones, the monofocals and the multifocals, and I love EOF with the monofocal, multifocal together. Now, first we talk about the elevation of the eye. If you look at the eye, the most common refractive error is a sphere, myopia or hyperopia, followed by, if you look at this chart, followed by astigmatism. Why? Because there are two components of astigmatism. And then after that, if you look carefully, it is spherical aberration, all right? much higher than the rest. So now we have corrected refractive error, uh, mainly myopia or hyperopia. We correct astigmatism. We also have to start thinking about some other higher order aberration that we can correct. The problem with higher order aberration is that it's very pupil dependent. Almost every one mm uh, increase in pupil size, the higher order aberration is almost done. Similarly, for spherical aberration. We published a paper some quite some time back to look at how the different order of aberration affects our visual equipment. So we introduced the one order at a time, the same amount, 0 0.25 and 25 micrometers, which is not a lot. But you can see here the degradations of visual acuity compared to a person who has no aberration at all. The fourth, the twelfth order, which is a spherical aberration, actually contribute the highest amount of degradations of visual acuity. This is even higher than astigmatism or myopia. Alright? And if you look open both eyes, because sometimes the two eyes submit, they improve. Even with binocular, all right, there are hardly any improvement. If you look at astigmatism, for example, most of them improve, but it's not the case with spherical aberration. This chapter to show you this is spherical aberration. If you look at all the same amount of aberration, each one at a time, spherical aberration is very, very disabling. All right? So, when we do cataract, our cornea all have positive spherical aberration. Our well, different generation have different, but on average 0.27, the East Asian, the Singaporean has about 0.31. If you put in a positive spherical aberration, by definition, all positive lens will have positive spherical aberration. Alright? So if you add both, one and one together, you have a lot more spherical aberration post-operatively. So what we need to do, therefore, is put in a negative spherical aberration IOL to compensate the positive spherical aberration and to reduce the total spherical aberration of the gas. Of course, every corneal has slightly different spherical aberration. We can't customize it, but on average, we try to reduce as much as possible, all right? But it is not without problem. It has to be well centered. It cannot be too tilted. If the tilt is more than seven degree, or the decentration is more than 0 0.4 mm, well, it all depends how much negative spherical aversion is. 0.4 and seven, you start to have worse outcome than putting a positive spherical aberration out of that. Okay, and this is so much about monofocal, it's been half a century away now. Now I'm going to talk a little bit on multifocals. The multifocals you can see far and near, but it is 
not without problem. You have gland and halos. Alright, this part of the chart is far, this part of the chart is near. They can't make time. Halos are usually at night, almost usually is for distant vision. Yeah. Most people don't complain halos for near objects because the things have to be small, point source have to be small. Glare, that can be distance, mainly, sometimes intermediate. Contrast can be all, and contrast generally affect daytimes rather than nighttime. And finally, the depth of focus, the distance in which the thing is in focus. So you have distance focus, and then the near, they are not necessarily in focus. And nighttime, the depth of focus is even worse than daytime. So at the beginning, we have bifocal. You can say bifocal is split like the half of it is for distance, half of it is for near, the sum. There is 50 for far, 50 for near sum, that is 65 for distance, 60, 35 for near, and then some that is hepatized. By hepatized, it means it has been treated for nighttime vision. Alright, so they are different. For hepatized, you can say that at small pupil size, the daytime pupil size, they are about the same, but nighttime when the pupil dilate, they are more distant energy compared to near energy. But the reality with multifocal, while it allows you to see far and near, it is not without problem. If you have a distance, 100% focus on the phobia, you have very good contrast if you look at something distance, and you have no glare and halos. But once you have a near, you have a bifocal, you have some split of light, the sun distance energy, and then the sun near. Alright, if you look at some part, there's some, because they are bifocal, there's a focal in front of the retina, this causes lateral aberration, and this is what gives give rise to halos. Alright, and bifocals do not capture most of the light energy, don't use most. In fact, bifocals, you only use 80%, 40 about 40, 40, so 20% is lost, and that sometimes light up the ocular, the eyeball, giving rise to chandelier effect or some kind of a glare. There are many de definitions of glare. Alright, so the glare and halo, and this is what some patients say. If very some are okay, but some actually can be very bad. It's very subjective. It's very difficult to tell pre-operatively. Of course, the patient, as Dr. Shri Ganesh has said, if the high order aberration is high, and now there's a trend towards angle alpha as well, then you may have more problem. The problem with my focal is when they see me, they have to hold it at the right distance. And different my focals are different near. All right? So if they move a little bit, they start to get blurry and the patient has to move it back to the right distance to see well. So a lot of patients sometimes complain that they cannot see near and the main reason is because the expectation of near distance is not matched by the near of the mouth by focal. So you have to help the patient to look at the near distance. Okay, then now we have bifocal, in fact bifocal is almost on its way up now. Today it's mainly trifocal, trifocal is split light energy into further, usually 50% for distance, and then the near 50% is split between intermediate of and near. For most trifocals, more is for near, and less is for intermediate. But today there's a new physio hour called Trump, they reverse this. Alright, they have 30 for intermediate and 20 for near. So it's for different purposes. You can see that they're playing around, around with light energy just to achieve different purposes, but you sacrifice something in return. Now the good thing about my trifocal is that by splitting all this straight, you have 50 for distance, 30 for near. Alright, you will have halos, but the 20 intermediate kind of mass it, 
So the halo's effect is not as bad as the bifocal, and that's generally the reported case. And trifocals tend to capture about 85 to 88 percent of the light energy, so less light energy is being lost and uh, causes glare. So it is quite common to hear that trifocals has less glare and halos than bifocal. Alright, so but the trifocal is not exactly trimodal. This is the bifocal, it's bimodal, it's like a dual hump camelback. Alright, the trifocal is not tri hump, but it is in still dual hump, it's just that the trap here is less depressed. That means the depth of focus, if you use a threshold for a depth of focus, for example, you find that the depth of focus, in the case of bifocal, the near, you only have a depth of focus of about 15 cm, but trifocal, you can actually increase it to 25, 30 cm. Okay, so that's the advantage of trifocal, not so much a tri hump, but the near depth of focus is a little bit better, it extends from near to a bit more intermediate. The distance remains very much the same. So now you can go to a restaurant and the depth of focus, you do not need to hunt for it, hunt for the near point anymore. It's easier, the sweet spot, so to speak, is much bigger. And then the last one is an extended depth of focus. Now, what's the difference? This is a monofocal, this is an artificial corneal eye with a green light. That experiment, the bifocal, the monofocal have one single point. The bifocal has two points, two foci. The trifocal, the extended depth of focus is slightly different. Here you can see this is an elongated focus, a very tall distal focal point, and this a focal segment. So there is a kind of extended depth of focus. By the way, all this IOL comes in torrent as well. And uh, therefore, as Dr. Yeo spoken this morning, most of these patients actually will require torrent more than non torrent So what about the extended depth of focus? It has very good distance vision. It extends no harm all the way to about 70, 60 meters, centimeter. Then it's try to drop. It will drop off after that. All right. This is for non toric and this is for toric. So that means the near is not very good. And for that reason, a lot of us do micro mono vision. Micro mono vision means one eye aim for distance, the other eye aim for about three quarter of the upper between half to one diopters, depending on what the patient wants. And here you can see that with both eyes open, the near can go as close as 50 or even 40 centimeters. So let's compare this. This is distance corrected one eye. The bottom one is micro mono vision with both eyes open. You can see that the near has now improved a little bit without compromising much of the distant region. So, I'm using Zeiss here. This is by no means restricted to Zeiss. You have now standard monofocal. You have enhanced monofocal. This is the defocus curve of a monofocal lens. This is distant region. Alright, at most about up to 2 meters or sometimes 1 meter they see okay, 1 meter onwards, but after that they don't see clearly. This is the range of vision if you take this as an arbitrary threshold. This is generated using Excel chart. Alright, now this is near vision. There's no near vision, the patient needs to wear glasses. But there is no glare, and you know, the center spot is how this distant region, patient see distant region well, there's no glare and halo. This is the bifocal, 
There's a good distance vision, there's good near vision, but the depth of focus here is about 11 cm for this particular IOL. So for intermediate, for computer, for example, which is about 40 to 60 cm, the patient will probably need glasses. Alternatively, the patient will receive further uh, closer to the computer. Alright? Which most patients will complain of neck ache after some time. They have quite bad glass and halos. The color indicates the severity of the halo. Then there's a trifocal. The trifocal now, you can say that the depth of focus for near now, just now was 11 cm, now it's about 14, 15, 17 cm. So it's much better than the bifocal. The glare and halo is not so obvious, it is smaller. And finally, the extended depth of focus, which has a range from distance all the way to about 50 cent 60 centimeters. But anything nearer, the patient will need glasses. But the glare and halo is not as bad. Alright, so you can see based on the defocus chart, you decide what hour you want. Alright, so spectacle independence for the bifocal, general purpose trifocal. If the patients want a little bit contrast, for example, then extended depth of focus is good. So finally, to customize, to help you customize, first you ask the patient preoperatively whether they want to have spectacle independence. If the patient does not want, then monofocal, the decision is easy, straightforward. If the patient has any contraindications, all right, that another set of lectures, or to multifocal, then monofocal is the only way to go. If the patient is not motivated, a very strong personality, then perhaps it's better to stick with monofocals. But if the patient is easygoing, tolerance to glare and halos, then you may want to aim for multifocal. If not, if the patient is not so tolerant to that, you may try EDOF or mono vision with monofocal. Alright, now for monofocal, if the corneal astigmatism is normal, of course. If they have no astigmatism, you go for aspheric. If they have astigmatism, as pointed out earlier on by Dr. Ron Yeo, you will go for toric aspheric. If the patient has a history of refractive surgery, then you have to find out whether it's hyperopic or myopic. Myopic, you want to go for the highest aspheric IOL as much as possible. If it's hyperopic, I suggest you go for spheric. Because hyperopic LASIK tends to cause negative spherical aberration. Finally, if you think you cannot center the high well, well or there's a risk of tilt, then it is better to go for a neutral high well because this lens is the most tolerant to tilt and decentration. Alright, if the cornea has low spherical aberration, if you do measure them regularly, then go for the low SA. As for multifocals, if the patient wants very good near and distance vision, of course all of them would want to have distance vision bifocal. If it's intermediate and distance, near to intermediate and distance and trifocal is good. For intermediate to distance, of course, either. Bear in mind that the glare and halos on average is different. Of course, there are individual variations and they are quite wide. So that's end the parallel choices.